Uh, but Joanne Chapman is the head of the Landscape Department at Colonial Williamsburg, and she'll be speaking first. So Joanne, let me have you come on up and I'll try to get your PowerPoint going here. Let's see. lost your video. Uh oh. Well, Technical first of all, while we're working on this, I'll just here. start by saying thank you for having us here today. We, we do recognize that this is an important topic for certainly for Colonial Williamsburg, but also for Williamsburg as a whole and our surrounding. We first some reason it won't became aware before. of boxwood blight. Um, close to Colonial Williamsburg in 2017. And uh, I think our team did a great job keeping it at bay until last July. And that is when we first identified the case of boxwood blight um, in Ludwell Paradise Garden. Hopefully we'll get the, the PowerPoint sort of key. <laughs> I'm sorry. Stuff. We're But today, when we get this up and running, what we're what we do is go through um, when boxwood blight was identified. Okay. Where, <laughs> meaning which gardens, because it's more than one. Um, how we dealt with it in those individual gardens, yes. because we did deal with it differently, and the reasons why we took the method or chose the method that we did. And so I want to preface this first by saying that some of these techniques and methods are experimental. We are not recommending that um, you or homeowners take these approaches. We're doing this for uh, you know, an educational purpose and because we're dealing with such a huge volume of boxwood at Colonial Williamsburg, you know, I would recommend to you all, if you encounter this issue, that you follow the recommendations that have been outlined by the Boxwood Light Task Force and your local um, extension agent, you know. So anyway, so first slide, we're gonna talk about when we just, yes, thank you very much. So how did you do that, uh, by the way? <laughs> just tap just, on this side. And it oh, okay, so there aren't any and errors or anything. Perfect. It's just tap the right of the screen. Yeah. Okay, so first, now that we're here, before I get too far ahead of myself, I wanna introduce who's with me here today. These are key members of the landscape department and absolutely key members of dealing with the boxwood blight at Colonial Williamsburg. This has touched every single member of our staff to one degree or another. But this team here is the core team that has dealt with it uh, through this process. And starting back in 2017, I mean, immediately at that time, Melissa was the, uh, well, our IPM technician at the time put together protocols and a, and a boxwood blight kit. And so our team was, was educated and ready. Uh, so we have been monitoring the boxwoods for five years, you know. So anyway, the team here with me today is Melissa Sharifi. Please stand up. She's the landscape. <laughs> Landscape manager for the historic area, and she works with our contractor in the historic. Well, she works with our two teams of, of horticulturists that take care of the 26 iconic gardens in the historic area. And she works with our contractor in Merchant Square and at the inn and the lodge and the spa and the Griffin Hotel. And she also manages our landscape nursery operations, uh, a portion of them. And then our other landscape manager, John Lack, um, also helps to manage the operations at the landscape nursery, but he is also uh, manages our arborist team and our IPM technician. And he works uh, with our contractor at our support sites like uh, Bruton Heights and the Visitor Center, and he is our 
con con our landscape construction manager as well. So any projects that include uh, large projects that include landscaping, like the streetscape and the ex museum expansion and the mark, you know, the parking lots of Virgin Square that have been um, renovated. The lands John manages all the landscaping of projects like that. And then we have our lead arborist, Charles Gardner. And Charles was instrumental in helping us get established as a arboretum, a certified arboretum. It was his idea and he persisted and we're very grateful for him for that. And we are level two currently and working hard to get to level three. Charles also manages all of our tree work and our tree health care and our annual tree planting and so much more. Really, I'm just I'm just hitting bullet points here, you know. And then um, Dave Stell is our IPM technician. Stand up, Dave, please. <laughs> and he's really responsible for plant health care you know, throughout the historic area, really throughout the properties. And he is uh, obviously Boxwood Light has become a big part of his responsibility. The treatment of, I think it's all Dave did after July last year, it was just 100% focus on treatment and prevention of boxwood blight. Um, but he does a lot more than that as well. He trains our staff and he um, manages invasives and you know, so much more. So anyway, that's the team. So I lost my slide. Let's see, am I getting your, eight, your messages? Uh Okay. Sorry. Right. Let me do that. <laughs> do that too. Here, let's go back to this. Where do you Here, want to go? You want to go Forward. Back. Back. Yeah, that's. You click on this side of the screen, okay. it'll take you back. Okay. So this is where I want to start. This is a chronological order of um, chronological order of where the boxwood blight was identified and when. So it was first identified at number one, which is a Ludwell Paradise, July twenty eighth. And then on August 2nd, and that was an extensive case at Ludwell Paradise. Then at Providence Hall, all the way over number two across the property, we identified a small, very small piece of boxwood blight at Providence Hall. Then had a little break. And then August 26, it was identified at St. George Tucker, number three, all the way back down the other side of campus. And then on August 30th, we found it in the governor's palace, which was, you know, these were all, Ludwell Paradise and the palace were heartbreaking, really, because that was also an extensive case. And then on uh, September 14th, these dates are, this is, the 14th is when it was actually we got the, the confirmed diagnosis. So they were really actually identified on different different dates, but they're sort of lumped together, these last three at the Everard Garden, Palmer, and Moody. And so, as I said, when we go through this presentation, you'll see that we've dealt with these differently in different locations, and it's because of the extent of the disease or just logistics of dealing with it or getting into the property. So um, that's where we're at, Melissa. Hello, I am um, just, just gonna review the symptoms real quick. Uh, Y'all are probably familiar with them at this point, um, but boxwood blight is a fungus um, that 
was detected in Connecticut first in 2011. Um, it only infects above ground <coughs> portions of the plant. So the roots, it's not in the roots and it's not thought to be in the trunks. It's in the leaves and the green, um, the green tips, the branches. Uh, it spreads rapidly. I mean, it, within hours, uh, the plants can show symptoms in the right conditions. Um, it, the, the disease likes, you know, um, mild weather, 70 degrees, uh, high humidity or rain uh, helps to spread it. And again, it can just explode pretty much overnight. Um, the spores can remain viable for uh, five, seven years uh, in the soil. Um, and the, the symptoms that we look for, uh, there's three, three symptoms. Uh, you look for the, the big, like classic leaf spots. It's, it's uh, usually they um, have a like a dark border and a light tan center. Uh, and then the the really the thing that catches a lot of people's attention is that is defoliation. The plant will just shed green leaves, um, shed brown leaves, uh, just trying to get get the uh, disease out of it. Um, and then the third thing that we look for are these long, uh, dark kinkers on the stems. Uh, it looks like somebody has taken a Sharpie and kind of drawn lines on the stems. Uh, the, the leaf spots and the defoliation you can get from other diseases, but really those, the long, um, dark kinkers are, are um, not seen with anything else. Um, all right, so. Okay. Oh, here we go. So as part of our protocol, we uh, trained our staff to ID it in the field. Um, once we, we had a positive field identification, we, uh, we then would take it to the lab. And in this case, we took it uh, immediately that day to Mike Likens in Chesterfield. Uh, he's a plant pathologist. He was actually the he retired state uh, plant pathologist. Uh, and uh, he put it under the microscope and was able to ID it. It's hard to see, but the spores look like um, snowflakes. Uh, and then once it was ID, they, Mike Likens, and then we also worked with Dr. Hong with uh, Virginia Tech. Both of them visited the site and uh, helped us kind of comb through the gardens and look for any more uh, infected plants. And at that time we didn't find anything. But um, yeah, and so, and this is all within days. Uh, so we immediately pulled everybody in, all of our staff in and kind of had a refresher and uh, went through the symptoms. Mike Likens was there with us. Uh, and then we also brought our contractor in and uh, had, had them, Mike Likens uh, trained, trained them. And actually the second case uh, that we found was found by Brightview uh, about an hour after the class. So it, that, that really um, paid off. So this is Ludwell Paradise. This is basically what it looked like when, when Dave discovered it. I was on vacation and he sent me a picture and I was like, I'm coming back right now. It was, it's so obvious. Um, but you can see mainly that defoliation. Uh, <coughs> By the time we had detected it, it was just widespread down the hedges. Um, and uh, it was pretty obvious that it was gonna, everything was gonna have to be removed. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. So when we found out, uh, we had to, well, we had to figure out how to do a large scale box of removal. Um, with smaller plants, you can burn them. Uh, you can put them in trash bags and put them out in the trash, but say uh, with Ludwell Paradise, it's a, it was a big garden. So we had to figure out how do we get rid of this? So uh, David and I came in on the weekend and we, have a, we had an old dump trailer. So we said, well, we'll make a box so we can, we can chip into it. So uh, we headed to Lowe's and um, spent bunches of money, came back and we built our, basically we built our own chip truck, if you will. Uh, 
And then we went over to Ludwell and you can see to the right, <clears throat> we built a uh, kind of like a shield for dust. Uh, so, I mean, we tried to keep the dust from moving elsewhere throughout Corey Williamsburg. Uh, and you can see it right there, the size of the boxwoods. I mean, they were huge. Uh, it was probably 90, 95 degrees out when we were doing this. So you can see the white suits. <laughs> wasn't wasn't a great time, um, but we did it. Uh, our crew did a really really good job. Took uh, it took you know two weeks. The whole process from start to finish took about two weeks. Uh, on the right, you can see um, we're cutting all the ground cover with the lawnmower, um, and that's basically for the next slide, which is or the one of the slides for sanitation. Um, we're gonna try to make it work. Okay. Oh, I got you. Okay. Hit, hit that. And that's just lots and lots of cutting and, and lots and lots of moving boxes. Okay, so if you're great. like me, I know. I've yeah. always heard that you either love the smell of that or you love the smell of box with and I love the smell of box with it. Uh, losing all those boxes is pretty sad. <laughs> and there's our chipper setup. We enclosed the whole entire thing. And then what we were gonna, what we did was we put a watering system around the chipper. Fortunately, it rained. So that was good. But what we were gonna do with the watering system is, is a, a misty spray to kind of catch all the particles and drop them down to the ground. So it wasn't spreading throughout. Um, it worked out real good. Uh, so we had chip disposal. So what do we do with chips? Well, we decided we were going to um, on another site in the woods, we were going to dig a big pit. We dug a really big pit with our loader, uh, and we would dump the chips inside of that. And then when we were done, we cover them back up with dirt. So, you know, they're gone. They're, they're not going to bother any other boxwood. They're probably 15 feet deep. Um, and that was the solution that we had to, uh, to get rid of such a large scale boxwood garden. <coughs> One more? Oh. Oh, yeah, one more. Yeah. So, sanitation, the reason we were cutting, we were using the lawnmower to cut down the ground covers. We needed it close to the ground. So, then we got propane torches. Again, it was 90 degrees out. Uh, but we had to go around David, myself, Jim. Um, we were going around and we pretty much burnt the entire property on the floor. Um, and that is what we could come up with to try to kill the blight. Uh, and that took, you know, three or four days just to do that. Um, behind that, the garden's so big. Uh, but it worked, it worked out real well. Uh, just, uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> <clears throat> and if I could just add, um, basically that was three, three people that had to report to the site. They ate lunch at the site. We delivered them lunch. And then once they were done, they left and went to their cars and had to leave. So it was a very time intensive two weeks uh, to try and wrap that garden up. Um, and as you can see, this is Providence Hall, our second um, site that we found. And um, you know, this site is about bordering the golf course. So it has a lot of deer pressure there. Um, not as much pedestrian traffic, um, very small infection as well. Um, so this is a completely different removal than the Ludwell Paradise. In this uh, instant we, instance, we tried the selective removal. And as Joanne mentioned earlier in the presentation, this is not recommended by you know, the Boxwood Blake Tax Task Force, but with the amount of boxwoods we have on site, it's, we're trying, a couple different experimental methods and hopefully you know something can work so we can use that moving forward and as you can see the size is about the size of a softball um, and if you look it may be hard to see on this photo but this was really early in the stages and it actually has a greasy look to it um, which is you know prior to defoliation so step and 
Dave, at, towards the end of the um, presentation, we'll talk about a boxwood blight kit, but this was kind of the starting of that. Um, and whenever you're doing a removal like this, it's almost like surgery. You need to have everything on site. Um, sanitizing your tools as you go is very important. As you can see, Tyvek suit, uh, long rubber boots um, is, is key, just so you don't want to cross contaminate and prior to even starting this removal, Melissa actually sprayed an anti-desiccant and a fungicide on the boxwood just so, you know, the spores wouldn't be moving around and, you know, everything would be a little bit more contained. And you can see I'm actually working around the infection site. I believe it was about a two to three foot radius outside of that infection site. And I basically just would prune around the site and the last piece to cut was actually the infected area. And you can see I put the uh, painter's tarp down first so then any spores would fall on the painter's tarp. And basically that tarp would actually contain the boxwood and I'd wrap it up towards the end for removal. And as you can see it, you know, by the end of it, the gap was about, you know, six feet. Um, I pruned um, the boxwood down to about, you know, uh, index finger size branches. Um, and actually this boxwood is flushing out with no infection on it currently. Um, and after all the uh, pruning was completed, we actually did burn the area underneath the boxwood. And you can see here, I'm bundling up all the boxwood and that'll go into the dumpster at the end. And one state, one thing that we did at Providence Hall that was different from other sites is we actually put a bird netting around it uh, just because with the size of the boxwoods, we were actually able to complete this. Um, there's other areas that we were unable to net due to the size, but just to keep deer away from it and also birds because they can also spread it as well. Uh, Dave? So uh, the next spot we found, I found it while uh, at, by this point I had been treating um, at this point, all we've used so far is Dacano and Vapor Guard, which is a, an anti-desiccant it, we're using it to seal it off, and then the Dacano is a fungicide. Uh, so while treating, I came across another one at St. George Tucker. As you can see, they were very large plants. Unfortunately, we lost some of the pictures, but uh, so basically it was found inside some like a, a courtyard within the boxwood plants because the plants had little squares. So part of it was actually inside those little squares and some on the outside as well. Uh, so when I found that, first thing we did is we quarantined it off with ropes and signs. You can see the signs um, in this photo. This particular photo is actually after we had removed some of it, a fair amount of it. This was basically, it came out to a nice corner along the walkway and the grass there. Uh, so, uh, after we roped it all off, um, being that it was in such a tight area, we had to pass through a lot of other boxwoods. Um, yeah, that's the, uh, so you can see we had to cut a little bit of a pathway there so we could get through. And again, this is afterwards, after we did it, when we treated, but the first thing we did is we covered these plants that you can see here with uh, plastic. So as we were passing in and out to that area, we would uh, not infect the plants moving back and forth by them. Uh, so basically how we did it is we worked from the clean area to the dirty, like what John was saying is uh, you, you, start, you start where it's clean to clear out the area. So we cleared this path and where it actually was, if you went through that path, it was just to the right. And there was a spot about two feet off the ground. Um, 
size of maybe like a basketball, elongated, more like a water melon. Um, but uh, so we removed that. And then the previous picture around the edges is what you can see. Uh, along the way, we've had to sterilize our tools. Again, we'll get to the whole kit. Uh, we use the sterilization agent. Um, and as we were cutting it, you would, uh, you would continue to uh, tip your tools. It's a good idea to have uh, like a few different tools so you can dip one because it doesn't instantly sterilize it. You want it in there a few minutes. So we would put one in the bucket, pull the other one out, make a cut. And uh, we would really get us as we got closer, very, you know, very uh, diligent with that and, you know, make sure we weren't cutting into that diseased area before uh, before going on. And this is after we were finished, um, basically similar to what the first picture was, uh, that we went back again with uh, sterilant and uh, just sprayed everything again. And that's after burning. Uh, we're try we tried to do as much as we possibly could. Uh, so that was one of the bigger of the small infections we found. And so far, you know, I'm not seeing anything there. The only thing you see is some browning from where we burned it. Oh, then that we got into the governor's palace. So that's, that's gonna be a little bigger than what I did. But, uh, with the governor's palace, we actually, it became another large one. So Charles handled that. So another large scale box with removal. Uh, this particular removal, we had actually two walls that we needed to breach. So we had the entrance to the to the palace, with the big doors, oops, and then we had the wall right there. Um, so we 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 figured it out, um, and we. Yeah, you have to find a sweet spot. Oh, okay, so here we go here with the boxwood. You can see how it's been traveling down the side of the boxwood, either by lawnmower, people, deer, whatever. But you can see how it moves with whatever brushes up against it. Uh, <clears throat> you can see there is the after effect of removing the boxwood again really hot out we had uh we had the palace gardeners helping us out with that one so their entire crew is with our entire crew um and we we started cutting it all down <coughs> so david was talking about sanitation so now if you can imagine we're using now we're using a loader now we're using this is our dingo our compact mini skid um chainsaws so we're, we have to sanitize everything because all of this equipment goes throughout Columbia Williamsburg so every time we use that we have to sanitize everything uh, what we did was we would cut it throw it over the wall and then we would take the dingo and then move that to the chipper which is in front of the palace same same scenario we're chipping it up we have mist keeping the dust down the palace is kind of like a central location too so there's boxwoods all over mm -hmm. Got the chipper inside. Obviously, we closed off the palace. Um, and that was the best place we could put the chipper uh, to keep. It, it kind of worked out too because it, the wall it's walled off. So that kind of helps us keep it contained a little bit as well. <clears throat> so after we were done, um, there's uh, Lance and Johnny. They're, they're burning. It's gravel. So... How do we get all the spores out of the gravel? Well, you sit there and you burn and you rake and you burn and you rake and you burn and you rake. And they did that for quite some time. You can see the discoloration of the shirts. That's sweat. <laughs> Very time consuming. So uh, 
unfortunately, that was another rather large example that we lost a lot of uh, plants on. Um, some of these other ones are not quite as bad. Uh, we're getting into uh, Everard and uh, Palmer are the first two. They were both very small and we were able to uh, remove both of them with uh, those two actually I did on my own. Um, they were that small of a thing. It was a couple plastic bags worth. Uh, not to say it's simple, you wanted to do everything. You still have to do everything, the sterilization and all that. But uh, the next picture should show, yes. This is, this one's interesting because this is the one we found at Everard. And when that particular spot was located, I wasn't quite sure if it was blight. We really didn't know. Um, I sprayed that one with Xerotol, which is kind of a peroxide type chemical. Uh, I sprayed that and that same morning when I was working on that, the palace showed up. So this particular spot actually kind of got put off for a while. The interesting thing is it did not spread. It was almost two weeks before we actually sent a, uh, sample in and had it confirmed and we're like oh well that actually is because I'd looked at it and it hadn't spread you know after a week or so and I really didn't think it was it but it looked suspicious so that's what you want to see you see it's low at the area uh, you know it's very close to the ground that's one of the things with it is it spreads by water splashing uh, so a lot of times you'll see it low not always so uh that was a pretty ideal situation. The one at Palmer was very similar. I don't have a picture, but it was a very similar size and look to that. And it was just removed with uh, basically um, what I try to do in those as much as you can. It's all the same things moving from where it's clean into it. You want to take an area, you know, find a good kind of break spot and go a few feet out from it at least. Uh, and uh, what I did on these little ones, when you get down to it, you actually you want to take your, like a trash bag and just put it over the infected area and cut it off. And then it's already in the bag rather than cutting at it and it falling on the ground and leaves falling off. It's just a better way to help contain that from uh, spreading more. Um, so those are kind of ideal situations. If you can call anything of getting this disease ideal, that's, caught early. And again, it's because I was going over these plants so much spraying and all. So, you know, we caught those quite early. Moody. Moody was a little bit of a sad one. It's a very beautiful garden. Um, uh, again, that's back on the other side of town over near where the small one John found. Um, very interesting thing about Moody is it did not work as nicely as uh, Palmer and Everard did as far as the spreading. Um, we have some theories on that. We're not sure without getting too deep into it. I don't know if it's the difference between the chemicals we used or more of a difference between the microbiome. I believe that the microbiome, and there's a whole study on that that I'm not gonna get into. Uh, Everard in particular was shown to have a very strong microbiome that would naturally fight the uh, boxwood blight. So we think that's why that one at Everhard uh, didn't spread so much. Moody, on the other hand, uh, spread more. Um, the day I found it, and the second picture is six days later, uh, you can see it looks like there was a mechanical transfer on the first picture. We're imagining possibly a rake handle or something being linked against it because you can see there's two vertical lines. There's actually three. You can't really see the third one in the first picture because it was extremely faint. Uh, you can see it's two vertical lines and like a patch on top. Uh, that one I sprayed on the first day of finding it with Dacanil, the fungicide, but it's not really meant to cure it. Um, I didn't spray it with the zero to that I sprayed at Everard, but now I'm spraying everything with that because we got the good results. Still, I think it's more the plant itself fought it more. Uh, so that one, 
we were hoping we'd take a couple small sections out, but by the time we got to it, uh, we ended up taking half of that entire circle out. The centerpiece stayed, and uh, so far it's doing fine. And one of the super interesting things, as you can see, the ones we removed were English, the ones, but you can see two standing that are American that were in contact with those English boxwoods, but they never did, uh, it never transferred to them. So that's exciting. And you can also see that in this case, we tried to leave the woody parts. Uh, certainly would never recommend pruning a box with that way, but we felt we may as well give it a shot, leave it there and see if it'll come back alive. Uh, you know, it looks bad. We burnt the grass and everything anyway. So we're like, hey, it might, it might flush back out. Kind of doubt it, but <laughs> I, I'm still keeping my fingers crossed on that one. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think that's one of the biggest takeaways of just how quick it can spread. Those earlier pictures show that it just uh, it's pretty amazing how how quick that went. Um, as opposed to the other one. So what we're doing now is trying to stay on top of it. Uh, we, uh, as a whole, we try to avoid working on the plants when they're wet. Uh, unlike when we were removing them, we wanted to keep it wet to contain it, but you don't actually want to work on around boxwoods at all when they're wet, because it's just more likely to spread that way. Um, we're still using, you can see him there, he's spraying the, uh, we're using a product called Vapor Guard. There's another one called Wilt Proof, that's the same thing. Uh, it's like a pine oil type thing you spray on there and it actually hardens up a little bit and it just creates a layer, a physical layer that between, you know, the uh, leaf and the, if the infection were to get to it, it wouldn't actually contact the leaf. Uh, We've been using uh, Dacano as a fungicide. It's a preventative. Uh, there are other fungicides we're gonna probably try to work into the rotation uh, this year. Uh, one thing, uh, mulching is recommended because it can grow in the ground. If you put mulch, uh, that can help keep it from splashing up from the ground uh, to get back in there. But uh, yeah, I think the key thing is Early detection, as you can see, very much minimalized what we had to remove on some of those situations. And so that's what we're hoping we can do is just stay diligent, try to treat it as best we can. And if we see it, act quickly. There it goes. So to act quickly, we've prepared these kits. So uh, we have a few of these made up already that um, if we see something, we can just grab this kit, grab a couple tools and go. So we'll, all you need to bring is your, your own, uh, maybe your sprayer and your loppers. Uh, so when we find these small ones, we can just grab this tote, take it out there and it has everything we need. Um, it's got, this is showing one of the, uh, the Fizan 20, and the fight back RTU, they're basically just uh, anti-fungicides like you spray on your counter. Something to, uh, the Fizan is a concentrated version of it, so you can dump it in a tank and spray it much wider than what you would do with the thing. Uh, bleach, we use bleach. Um, I have I have it written down on a sheet with the thing of what uh, ratios. And actually, I in the bucket you can see I actually made marks on the bucket to wear bleach and water to get, so you don't have to think. So you just put the bleach and you fill it with water and that's the ratio to dip your tools in. Um, there's some hand sanitizer, there's some caution tape and garden close signs so you can rope it off, that's step one. Um, again, I wrote all those steps down and they're gonna be with this just so it's not about thinking, it's about going and doing it and getting it done. Uh, booties, very important to have at minimal some kind of booties uh, to cover your feet. Uh, rubber boots are ideal because they're easier to clean off. Um, gloves, goggles for your eyes for all those chemicals. 
trash bags, roll of poly, uh, like we use the poly to, in some cases, if it's a big area, we'll throw it on the poly and wrap it up, or we'll use the poly to, like in that one I showed you at uh, George Tucker to cover the area if you have to bring it by healthy boxwoods. Um, the container I mentioned, uh, the WD-40 is important because when you sterilize your tools with the bleach or the fungicides, it will, uh, they're corrosive and it will destroy your tools. So you clean those off, you wash them best you can and you spray them down with WD-40 to protect them. Uh, Lysol wipes, make sure the Lysol wipes you have are the right um, ones listed. If you look at the Boxwood Blight Task Force website, they have all that information. Great site. Uh, I recommend you look at it, uh, measuring cup, just for in case uh, you need it to measure. But like I said, I actually marked it all out so you don't even have to think uh, with these. Um, I think that's all that's for me. What's next? What does the future hold? Yes. So, what does the future hold? If only, if only we knew. Um, we do know that we still have um, the potential for more issues throughout Colonial Williamsburg. So we will continue to um, our immediate future anyway is continued preventative treatments and monitoring, monitoring these experimental areas, but also monitoring all the other gardens with boxwood blight and really some restoration. We do hope to begin with uh, Ludwell Paradise. Ludwell Paradise is a really important property, first property that was purchased by Rockefeller. Um, it's gonna play, you know, it's just a really important property and it was a beautiful garden. And, but there is no way that we can duplicate that garden to the extent that it was. Those boxwoods were 10 feet tall, and there were hundreds of them. We took out, what, a couple hundred? You know, we, we can't duplicate that. And many of the gardens, they're, 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 we don't know for a fact that these were the boxwoods, but it was one of the first gardens that was installed. More than likely, as many of the gardens were, the boxwoods were purchased as mature boxwoods from gardens largely down in South Carolina. That cluster up there in the far right, those are properties where boxwoods were purchased in South Carolina, dug up, and that's the property there in South Carolina, the house on the top left. That was one of the architects landscape architects working with Shercliffe that drew that's those are those plants down there in South Carolina dug up balled up and put on a rail car and shipped to Williamsburg so we 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 can never duplicate that that garden and get that size again you know as much as we would love to and that's why this is so heartbreaking these are you know they were very special boxwoods. And it was really hard on this team and, and the whole department because we're not in the business of, you know, taking plants out. We're in the business of keeping plants healthy and, and beautiful. So the conditions were difficult to work in, but emotionally, it also took a toll on, on the group. So, um, so what do we do? You know, what this is our big question. What do we do? And fortunately, we have um, spent some time with Bennett Saunders from Saunders Brothers, and he's been great uh, educating us a bit. You know, initially we thought, well, we're just going to go in and we'll replant with one of these new disease resistant boxwoods, you know, new gen, right on. 
No, not so fast. Uh, we learned from that we really need to wait like a minimum of five years, which is very hard because we want our gardens to be, you know, intact and beautiful all the time. So what do we do? Um, this is this is the the landscape or the concept plan of the garden that we will at some point in time restore. But we're going to be going through a few steps before we get there. Um, so we do really want to go back with boxwood at some point, but we have to do it smart and we have to do it in stages. So we are very likely going to um, be installing some of our English boxwoods that we've grown, propagated down at the landscape nursery. They were propagated from boxwoods in the Everard garden. We're gonna use them as sentinel plants and not, not a lot, maybe four. They're only this big. So they're very easy if they get infected. It'll be very easy to pluck out and put in a plastic bag and remove. But these are gonna be the canary in the coal mine. You know, it's a sentinel plant. It will, if, the, this, if it's boxwood blight is still there, it will show up on these plants and we'll know, okay, we're not ready yet. And then we'll come back and maybe do it again. Well, maybe we'll do it three times. We haven't gotten that far in our determination of what the process is gonna be, but I, could, I can sort of see that. But at, at some point, if it, we're gonna draw the line and then we're just gonna have to say, we can't go back in with boxwood, which is what all the literature says right now. But we're hoping to find, you know, we're hoping that maybe we're gonna find another way. But, um, and if that, we reach that point, then we'll replant with something that is going to represent the boxwood, but they won't be boxwood, like a soft touch holly or, we have a, yo, a lot of yopon throughout Colonial Williamsburg also. So we don't want to turn the Colonial Williamsburg into now, you know, all yopon gardens. So we're going to have to do, you know, and again, when I, we do not want to get into that monoculture thing again. So we will have to, that's where we're at. You know, it's one step at a time, one day at a time. And we have to really see how these gardens we, we've been in the, the, the conditions have not been right for boxwood blight, but when it gets ripe again this year, we really need to see how these gardens uh, react. So Melissa's going to do a recap for us, um, but that's it. All right, I'll just recap our uh, management methods in each garden. So in uh, Ludwell Paradise, uh, the first one, we did it by the book. Um, it was a complete removal. One thing that we didn't mention is that after we flamed uh, the ground and the ground cover, we brought in several inches of topsoil and, and just capped it all off. And then we overseeded it with mustard, a cover crop of mustard. Mustard has a, um, natural antifungal properties and it the, the chemical that uh, makes it spicy uh, well actually uh, has those antifungal properties so uh, the mustard's up and growing right now we'll plan to um, terminate it the spring and till it under and it acts uh, like a soil fumigant um, so again Ludwell Paradise complete removal by the book uh, Providence Hall, we did the, um, the second case. We, uh, that was the um, precise re precision removal where we cut it out almost like cancer. Um, and we netted, that, we netted those. Uh, Tucker was, he, the, was another one that was very small that we did the precision removal. The, the boxwoods are so large, we were not able to net them. So that one is precision, precision removal with no nets. Um, the palace, um, uh, the palace was the complete removal, and 
uh, the flaming, but we also uh, covered the, the, all the planting area with plastic uh, and hoping to take advantage of solarization. So that'll, plastic will stay on probably until midsummer. Um, needs a, a few uh, months to heat up and get to that temperature. So <clears throat> that was complete removal and then the plastic um, solarization. Uh, Everard and Palmer, uh, they were the same um, as Tucker. It was just the precise removal, no net. Uh, Moody was the one um, where we uh, flush, you know, or cut them down to stumps um, in hopes that uh, maybe they can flush back out because again, the disease is not in the trunk or the roots. Uh, so we basically just removed all the leaves. Um, so that was another method that we had, that we are trying. And all of this is done with Dr. Hong and his team. Uh, he's one of the top specialists in the world. Uh, so um, yeah, he's excited, he's monitoring, we're kind of a little experiment for him, but um, he's working, we're working very closely with them. So thank you. So I, I hope you all can see that we have a great team here that is dealing with fortunate. So um, we're open for questions if anybody has any questions. Okay. First hand I saw. Mentioned the American Boxwood, was it They are not as they're more resistant naturally, but they you know, in other parts of the country, I mean, I watched a video from Georgia and the boxwood fly was jumping from the English to the, to the American. Where did this come from? Um, in Williamsburg? Could you repeat the question? I'm sure. I'm sorry. The question was, what was the original question? <laughs> Um, it's yeah, first. it's not native here. Okay, so the question was, where did it come from? And it was first found in the United Kingdom and it was first identified in US in 2014? 2011. Oh, 11. Connecticut. Okay. And then it was, it was Connecticut, I think North Carolina, and then Virginia. Yeah, and, but for us, it was 2017. We learned of a neighborhood very close to, within two miles of Colonial Williamsburg. And then each year consecutively, it got closer, another neighborhood closer, another neighborhood closer. So we knew it was closing in on us, and honestly. And repeat the uh, responses from Melissa so that the Zoomers can hear them. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. So maybe we'll, maybe the group needs to come up here because you'll each probably have to take so something. So that they can hear it? Yes, please. Okay, it, it was first discovered in the United Kingdom uh, in 2011. Um, or no, I don't know when it was discovered in the United Kingdom, actually, it was discovered here in 2011, yeah. but it's a, not a native, it's not a native fungus. Um, and I, you know, there's, I think it's been around uh, for a long time, they just hadn't identified that the pathogen. It took them a while to idea. And there's actually two, they're just, they're very closely related, but there's two different pathogens. Throw their hands. So the question is, you as master gardeners, if you're out and about and or you're someone had to calls you about suspected boxwood blight, what should you do or who should you call? You should call your extension agent, forest hops, hops, right? Um, that's the that's really the, the thing to do. We are happy to be here and to share what we know, but we're not, um, we can't handle that 
for homeowners, you know. So really that the the line of communication is through Forest, your extension agent. No, they're still closed. That, that question was asking whether the gardens that we have um, found the box with the light, are they open to the public? And no, they are indefinitely closed. Okay. Okay, you sure. Go ahead. I'll get you next, Pat. Uh, the uh, insecticides are chemicals that you spoke about, um, how many of those and what are they that are available uh, for our consumption, commercial? No. Okay, the question is what chemicals would be available to a homeowner? Yeah. Uh, basically, we're using the same chemicals that is that are available to homeowners, they just fall under a different name. Um, the vapor guard is, is is actually on the shelf. You would we call wilt proof, and it's it's um it's a, a natural product. Uh, and again, it's the anti desiccant. So we're, we're creating a um we're trying to create a physical barrier to keep that fungus from penetrating the leaves. Um, and Dr. Hong has proven that that's actually as effective as the fungicides. The, another benefit to using the anti desiccant is the application rate or the the amount of times you have to apply it is way less so the the will proof or vapor guard you're going to get three to four months of protection from that whereas the fungicides you're looking at a seven to ten day cycle uh when when the disease is active and that's impossible for us to do it takes us six weeks to spray everything yeah. once yeah. so um we're doing the those applications trying to do them three times a year uh, but we're really we're li relying heavily on the anti desiccant. Well, you mentioned dacanil. Dacanil is the the fungicide exactly. There's a, there's different fungicides. Um, sulfur is another one. That's an organic one. Um, copper, uh, and then there's just a whole bunch of other. Mancozeb. Mancozeb. That one's available. Mancozeb. I think I'm saying it right. <laughs> it's M A N C O B E Z Z E B. Isn't isn't that the same ingredient as bacinum? No, the active ingredient no, is different. Mancozab is. There's yeah. a there's a the Saunders brothers have a list of a number of areas. Yeah, the, there's several websites that list them. Websites. That will list chemicals that are available to homeowners. Yeah, we we like the Boxwood Light Task Force website with the extension and Virginia Tech. Pat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you get other places you don't know how good that is to do it with anything right and if you want to use a hardwood mulch if you want to use things like pine needles or do you want to use it around up leaf repeat okay okay the question is what type of mulch uh would is would we suggest using the study um was done with hardwood mulch just like the regular double shredded hardwood mulch um, and again, you're just wanting to create a barrier between the soil and the leaves. So the pine, um, pine straw should work and compost should work. You just want to, you know, co cover any spores that are on the ground, um, and create a barrier and also to keep the water from splashing up on the leaves as well. Mm -hmm. Just that the compost comes from a comparable uh, you know, a place where they know that it's... Yeah, usually if it's if you're 
making compost, it, it's, it's uh, supposed to be heated, you know, it'll heat to a certain temperature that is going to kill most organisms, the pathogens. Yeah, so you want to get it from a reputable supplier, or if you know, if, if you're making your own, know what you're doing. <laughs> Seriously. Any other questions? What was the oldest box we found that had to remove? Question is, what is the oldest boxwood we found that we had to remove? Well, I tried. I tried to uh, count the rings. I had to you know, pretty much need a microscope. Um, it, it was at least two hundred years old, at least probably probably two two hundred fifty years. But the trunk is like this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Any other questions? Do you find that it's attached young ones versus they actually, uh, that's a really good question. Um, do we find that it attacks older ones or younger ones? Is, is it based on the age? Uh, Dr. Dr. Um, Dr. Hong has done a study on that and no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the age. Okay. All right, this will be our last question, I think. It's too. No. The question is: Did we remove the soil in any of the situations? No, that's impossible to do as well. That there's trees and we just um, we just did we just um, flamed it, flamed the top layer, and then created and then created a barrier. That's that's. That's the recommendation, and that's really all we can do. We were so happy to be with you all today. I think our time is up. Um,